Graduate Student Association here at Texas A&M University of Qatar. On behalf of the GSA Executive Committee, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. In order to make this lecture an enriching and educational experience for all, we would like to kindly ask you to mute your microphones and keep your cameras off throughout the duration of the lecture. Please hold your questions till the end of the lecture. In order to ask a question, you can either type it in the chat box below and send it to me, or you can raise your hand through the reaction given, and we will then give you the floor to ask your question. We are very honored and excited today to welcome Dr. Jens Kelliot Norskov today with us. Dr. Norskov is the Willem Kahn Rasmussen Professor at the Technical University of Denmark, DTU. Prior to this, he was the Leyland T. Edwards Professor in the School of Engineering at Stanford University and a Professor of Physics at DTU. He also currently serves on the board of the directors of the leading catalysis company, Heldor Topsu, and is the chairman of the Danish National Research Foundation. This spectrum of research has ranged from the infinitesimal quantum mechanical descriptions that shed light upon electronic behavior, all the way to developing the large scale materials that assist in sustainable energy and are greener for the environment. A true pioneer of his work, his concepts are used in science and as well as the industry to this very day. As someone who personifies the very essence of academic excellence, he has led the way forward in broad based application of catalysis. His contributions to the field of computer-based heterogeneous catalysis have been remarkable and present a gateway for a sustainable future and have led to him becoming one of the most highly cited researchers of our time, including by myself and other members of the TAMQ community. In recognitions of his outstand outstanding contributions to the field, he has been awarded the prestigious Niels Bohr International Gold Medal in 2018, the European Inventor Award in 2016, and the Irving Langmuir Prize in Chemical Physics in 2015. Dr. Norskov, thank you for agreeing to give this lecture to our community. And now without further ado, Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Um, what I'm, I'm gonna talk about today is uh, are some of the challenges that are in front of us if we want to develop a catalysis to produce fuels and chemicals in the future in a, in a sustainable way. And the outline is the following. First, first I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, why we need new catalysis. And uh, then I'm talking about some of the challenges to science that uh, uh, the, the uh, synthesis of uh, synthetic fuels and chemicals uh, pose. And then uh, the main part of, of my lecture will be uh, uh, reviewing how theory may provide, help provide understanding and, uh, and uh, point to uh, solutions. So uh, first, um, why do we need a new chemistry here? And, and we all know this, uh, this, is, this is from the um, IPCC. If we continue, um, with the current level of the CO2 emissions, we're going to use. We, we'll be looking at at the very, very drastic changes in the, in climate. Uh, uh, well, as soon as as uh, 2050, we need to find ways to reduce that, and and the, the only way we can do that is to to develop uh, a new chemistry. And let me illustrate that here. What what happens today? is that a large number of the, the, the products that define modern life, they are based on access to fossil resources. So whether we are talking about transportation fuels or fertilizers for agriculture or all the materials that surround us, including actually pharmaceuticals, then the carbon in here comes from uh, gas and oil and coal that has been refined in, uh, in, uh, in uh, these chemical plants that were developed over the last hundred years. So this, this development of chemistry is, is really one of, the, one of the big achievements of science. It has helped and uh, defines in many, many ways uh, uh, our modern life. Now, 
what we need to do if we don't want to rely on fossil resources, we need to find the, to find a new kind of chemistry. If we still want to be able to have fuels for storing energy, we still want to be able to produce uh, fertilizers, for instance, and to make all the materials and pharmaceuticals that we know today, we need to find a new way of making these. And one way is to um, use um, the power from solar and wind um, and uh, use that to drive the chemical processes where we take uh, very stable molecules like water, CO2 or nitrogen and transform them into these base chemicals uh, that we need. So that's the challenge. Now, the, the uh, devices that we need to be able to, to do this uh, could look something like this. This is a schematic electrochemical cell. And uh, we will drive this electrochemical cell by the power that comes from, say, wind turbines or photovoltaics. Could also be hydro um, uh, electricity. At one electrode, we oxidize water into molecular oxygen. We pull the electrons through the external circuit and the, the protons through uh, the electrolyte. And then at the other electrode, we are making the, the fuels and chemicals that we need. The simplest thing is to just uh, reduce the protons into a form hydrogen. But ideally, of course, we would take CO2, for instance, from the atmosphere or from point sources and reduce that into hydrocarbons or oxygenates that can directly replace the fossil resources or reduce nitrogen into ammonia, which is the basis for fertilizer, but also a, a, a large number of other, other uh, products. Now, the problem we have here is that these processes, uh, the way we uh, do it today, uh, don't run very efficiently. So the water splitting reaction or oxygen evolution reaction as it's known, is actually inherently very slow even with the best catalysts we know today. Uh, hydrogen evolution is, is fast. So reducing protons and forming hydrogen is something we can do very efficiently. I'll get back to that. But if we want to reduce CO2, uh, that's actually even less efficient than the water oxidation reaction at the other electrode. And the least efficient of what we know today is the nitrogen reduction. So we have some huge challenges here if we want to be able to do this in a purely electrochemical process. The alternative is to just make hydrogen and we say just, it still means that we need to make the water splitting or oxygen evolution more, more efficient. But we can take that hydrogen and then we act it with nitrogen or, or CO2 in a thermal process to form the products we need. Now, we do have these thermal processes are well known. But if we want to combine this with electrolysis, where we make the hydrogen, where we uh, have access to the electricity, then uh, we may need processes that are running under very different conditions than the, the ones we know today. The ones we know today are basically typically very energy efficient and they will be sitting on, on uh, places where you have a lot of energy. And uh, therefore they have been optimized for that. And we, it means very high pressures, typically very high temperatures. But if we want this decentralized, then we need lower pressure processes and we need lower temperature processes. And that, that uh, is, is another set of challenges. And I'll be addressing both the challenges to the uh, thermal processes and the challenges to the electrochemical processes. Now, we have of course been trying to develop catalysts for these processes for a long time, mostly by 
uh, shall we say, uh, trial and error experimentation. And uh, what I'm suggesting is that perhaps if we understand better what is going on, then we may have a better uh, uh, prospects of developing um, new technology. The example, the, the main example, I, I should say, uh, that I'm be using is, is uh, nitrogen activation, nitrogen reduction. And as I mentioned, that's the most difficult of, of them all. So it, it gives you an idea about what, what we are up to. Now, when it comes to a, a theory of, of catalysis, um, the phenomenal groundwork was uh, laid exactly 100 years ago by Paul Sabatier. He uh, introduced what is known as the Sabatier principle, illustrated in this figure here, namely that the best catalysts, the optimum catalysts, are characterized by bonding uh, molecules not too weakly and not too strongly. Um, and this has, has been guiding the thinking in the field for these uh, 100 years. Now, we do need to, to develop this further. And uh, there are good reasons for that. First of all, we actually, or, or at least the uh, Sabatier principle doesn't tell us which bond strength we should put on, on the x-axis. Also, it doesn't tell us where the optimum is. So in, in, in that sense, it's, it's not a theory because you cannot make a prediction that can be falsified experimentally or, or, or the opposite. And that's sort of the basis for, for natural science. Now, it also, if we don't know where the optimum is, we can't use it directly in, in catalyst design. So we need to sort of quantify um, this principle. And that's, that's what I'll be talking about here. So let's start by looking at um, the simplest possible reaction. And now I'll start by looking at the thermal processes. Let's look at ammonia synthesis. So this is the potential energy diagram for ammonia synthesis over the best catalyst known, uh, namely ruthenium. The, uh, you see here the potential energy diagram. Uh, actually, you see two. I'll only be looking at the full curve here, which has a much lower energy barrier, you can see, than, than the dashed one here. The dashed is actually for close packed surfaces, whereas the full line is for a step surface. And, uh, and uh, uh, this has also been confirmed experimentally, namely that, that uh, step surfaces are, are um, the key to be able to run a lot of these reactions. But what you see here are um, activation barriers for each of these steps here. You uh, add salt molecular nitrogen, you dissociate it, you dissociate hydrogen, and then you start hydrogenating the nitrogen, making one ammonia and then the, the uh, next one. And if you count it up, count all the transition state energies and all the energies of the intermediates, then in principle, at least, there are 14 relevant energies in the problem. That means if we want to optimize the system, in principle, we need to do it in a 14 dimensional space. Now that's obviously uh, very uh, difficult, but there are good reasons we don't need to do that. And let me illustrate it here. First look at the plot to the left. What is shown here is the transition state energy or activation energy for N2 dissociation. It is plotted as a function of the bond energy of nitrogen to the surface. There are results here for uh, different elemental metals, always steps. And uh, you can see that there is a clear correlation between the activation barrier and the nitrogen binding energy. It's the so-called scaling relation. Now, relations like this have been known in, in, in chemistry for many, many years, but it, uh, it was actually not until we could do accurate calculations of say uh, nitrogen binding energy or, or activation barriers that we uh, discovered that, that these are so, um, uh, that we find them in, in surface chemistry or, or catalysis as well. The reason is simply that it would be very hard to measure 
bond energy is all the way from minus one and a half EV, 150 kilojoules per mole, to positive uh, 0.8. But there are more scaling relations. You can see here, for instance, the energy of intermediates like adsorbed <coughs> NH2 or adsorbed NH also scale with the nitrogen binding energy. And when it comes to the activation energy for the hydrogenation step, they also scale with the bond energy. So I don't know what this uh, line here is. Um, so what it means is, in, in reality, instead of 14 independent variables, there's really only one. The, if you tell me the bond energy of nitrogen to your favorite catalyst surface, then from these scaling relations, I can tell you the energy of all transition states and all intermediates in the problem. That means that the, the um, nitrogen binding energy is a good descriptor. And it means that if we plot up here experimental data, experimentally ra uh, measured rates of ammonia synthesis, and we plot them as a function of the nitrogen bond energy to the surface, then they actually align very nicely into such a volcano relationship. And below, I show the same thing, but actually from the calculation. You can see the, the theory here um, very, very much looks like the experimental data here. There are two um, theoretical numbers here. One is without potassium added to the surface, one is with. I'll get back to that in a moment, but you should compare the red here because that is what uh, is, should be compared to the experiments because all of these catalysts have been uh, 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 promoted by adding potassium. Now, that was uh, ammonia synthesis and, and that looked com complicated, right? 14 different uh, parameters. But if instead of hydrogenating um, nitrogen, we uh, hydrogenate carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide, then it gets much, much more complicated because now we can make many different products. I'll just show five different products here, water, methanol, acid aldehyde, methane, and ethanol. You could have many, many more, um, but these are just the C1 and C2 um, uh, products. And each line here is one reaction pathway from these reactants to these products. So there are basically literally thousands of, of uh, pathways uh, in this reaction network. And to make any sense out of this is very, very difficult. We clearly need guiding principles here. And uh, the nice thing is that there are such guiding principles and uh, I'll illustrate it here. Each panel here in this plot shows the either the transition state energy or the adsorption energy of intermediates plotted as a function of some linear combination of the bond energy of carbon and oxygen to the surface. Here we have two descriptors, not just one like in ammonia synthesis, because here we can have either uh, the uh, old transition states or, or uh, intermediates can bind either through the carbon end or the oxygen end or both. So uh, what is shown down here, for instance, are each dot here is one different catalyst. And these here are activation bear or transition state energies for the CO bond breaking reactions that you, that you see up here on different catalysts. And you see this very nice scaling relation. In fact, every single transition state and every single adsorption energy shows a scaling relation with the carbon and the oxygen bond energy. So again, if you tell me the carbon and the oxygen bond energy to your favorite catalyst, I can tell you what the activation energy for all steps are and the stability of each intermediate in the process. That, that's a very, very strong, um, uh, powerful concept. And what it means is that 
there are really only two independent variables, at least to a first approximation in the, in the problem. That means that we can calculate the rate for making different products as a function of those two variables. So look here in the upper left corner. This is the calculated from a microkinetic model, calculated rate of making methane plotted as a function of the oxygen and the carbon bond energy to the catalyst surface. When we have those, we can use these linear relationships to define the activation energy and the energy of intermediates for every step. And then what, uh, the, what, what is shown here is a heat map so that deep red is high rate and the blue is low rate. And I put the different elemental catalysts on here with their, their uncertainties from the calculations. This is just to illustrate that we can actually, even with the uncertainties that we have in present day calculations, we can still uh, make meaningful predictions. But what, what you see here is that ruthenium should be the best catalyst for methane uh, production followed by rhodium nickel. That's exactly what is known experimentally. Lots of experiments over the last 50 years have, have uh, shown these trends. What is used industrially is nickel, and that's simply, it's not because it's best, but because it's cheap, or certainly much cheaper than ruthenium and uh, rhodium. If we move over here, we can do exactly the same calculation. Now, uh, the rate for making methanol and uh, now the optimum has moved to the right, as you can see. Uh, these uh, late transition metals are still reasonable catalysts. But if you move over here, you can see that uh, the rate for making hydrocarbons is much higher than the rate for making the alcohol. So it's still a very poor catalyst for, for making methanol. The only good catalyst is based on copper. And that's exactly what is known experimentally. Copper is the best catalyst that we know for this reaction. So again, this summarizes uh, decades of experimental data in a very, very simple way. It gives us a way to rationalize what is going on. Interestingly, if you look at the rate for making ethanol, there are no catalysts that are very good at making ethanol um, because those that get close are much better at making hydrocarbons or making uh, uh, ethanol, uh, methanol, sorry. So there are actually no good uh, ethanol catalysts. And that's uh, exactly what is known. There are no industrial catalysts for making ethanol directly from CO and hydrogen uh, today. Now, once we have these, these um, uh, scaling relations that give these volcano plots, then we, um, we can uh, begin to use it in, in design. And I'll, I'll just show a, a very simple example here. What, what is shown here is um, the rate for making uh, ammonia again as a function of the nitrogen adsorption energy, just like you saw it before. We have ruthenium as the best, but you can certainly imagine that if you took something like molybdenum, which is over here to the left, where that binds basically binds nitrogen too strongly so that you just form a, a nitride on, on, on the surface, and you combine it with something like cobalt, which binds nitrogen very weakly and therefore has a very high barrier for N2 dissociation. If you could combine those two, then you should be able to get into a region close to ruthenium that is a, a very good re uh, region. And uh, Klaus Jakobsen here from the Helder Topsoil Company, he, uh, he uh, actually made catalysts uh, that has both cobalt and molybdenum in the active site. So over here to the right, you see experimental data from uh, his work. You see the measured rate of ammonia synthesis as a function of the ammonia output. You have iron down here, not nearly as good as 
ruthenium in black. And then you see this cobalt molybdenum, it's a subnitride, but, but uh, it's still cobalt and molybdenum metallic sites at the surface. It is as good or perhaps at, at, at certain conditions better than ruthenium. So this is a very, very simple concept that, uh, that uh, allows you to, to uh, construct much better catalysts uh, in, a, in, a, in a very simple way. Here's another example. This is in electrochemistry now. As I mentioned, we do have good catalysts for the um, uh, reduction of protons to form molecular hydrogen. And it's shown over here. Here are experimental data. The, all the uh, data points here are, are experimental uh, rates or exchange current densities. Uh, and they are plotted as a function of the only natural descriptor for this process, namely the uh, free energy of hydrogen adsorption to the catalyst surface. And you see we have some very good catalysts up here at the top of the volcano. They are the uh, platinum group metals. We know they're good, but uh, unfortunately, they are also uh, very expensive. So once we know that what we need to find is something that binds hydrogen with a free energy close to zero, then we could simply start looking around in our, in our computational models and uh, look for cheap alternatives. And, and one alternative that uh, we came up with was uh, molybdenum disulfide. It's a layered compound, as you know, and the basal planes are co totally inactive. But at the edges of, uh, the, of these platelets of molybdenum di disulfide, uh, we predicted that they should actually uh, be close to a delta G of, of zero and should have a decent activity, not as good as platinum, but a decent one. The nice thing is that molybdenum disulfide is cheap, so you can actually now begin to optimize for the number of these active sites. So even if they are not as, as active by themselves, you can now have a much larger loading of active sites. And uh, what, what has happened in the last 10 years or so is that people have gotten better and better at making nanostructured uh, catalysts. Uh, it's shown here, here are some of the first ones that were sort of triangular molybdenum disulfide uh, nanoparticles on, on gold, and then more and more sophisticated um, synthesis has made much larger number of, of these active sites. And if you look here, over here to the right, if you look at the measured O potential at a fixed current density of 10 milliamps per square centimeter, and you look at what people have been able to obtain experimentally in the last uh, 10, 15 years or so, then what you see is a very, very steep downbend in the O potential. That is, we can make this better and better. We, we never get close to platinum, which is down here, but we are certainly approaching it first with the sulfides and la later came also phosphides. Uh, and, uh, but this is really a, 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 a very nice development where we are now making sort of cheap platinum by loading a lot of, of these molybdenum disulfide uh, structures with a lot of edges so that we get a lot of uh, catalytic activity. Now, as I've tried to illustrate here, we can rationalize a large amount of the experimental data uh, over the last uh, 100 years or so in these, with these simple concepts. And we can even use them to guide us towards new catalysts. But there's another interesting uh, consequence of, of these scaling relations, and I'll try and illustrate it here. What, what you see here is uh, one of these uh, uh, heat maps that I've been using several times. What I'm showing is the rate of ammonia synthesis, again, thermal ammonia synthesis, as a function of two parameters, the transition state energy for N2 splitting and the bond energy of dissociated nitrogen. And what you see here is that those two parameters for all the materials we know, they are not independent. We have a nice scaling relation here. But of course, on the computer, we can uh, 
calculate the rate as if we could vary those two independent of each other. And that's what I'm showing here. These are calculations by Yu Singh and uh, Joey Montoya and uh, Brian Raw. And what this reveals is that there are actually in principle much better catalysts, but they are far away from where we are in terms of those catalysts we know. That is when we try to optimize um, uh, the usual catalyst for ammonia synthesis, what we're really doing is we're running up and down this, this line here. So the cobalt molybdenum that I showed you earlier is, is about here. But what we should really do was to uh, try and find materials that do not follow this scaling relation. And that's what I mean by the fact that we really need a shift in paradigm for catalysts in order to get down there. I'll uh, illustrate it in a, with another process. What I'm showing over here to the left is a similar plot. It's the scaling relation this line here is the scaling relation between the transition state energy or free energy for uh, the rate determining step in the oxygen evolution reaction in water splitting plotted as a function of a measure of the bond energy of oxygen to the surface. And you see here the nice scaling relation that the optimal catalysts are way off here. And the fact that, that we are bound by, by this scaling relation that keeps us off the optimum is something that you can uh, perhaps see here in this uh, collection of experimental data, again, over the last 10 years or so. This is now the all potential for the oxygen evolution reaction at a fixed current density. Lots of data from the literature. And what you see here is unlike for the hydrogen evolution reaction, we really don't see any significant downbend. So even though these are, are, are high profile papers that, that, uh, that uh, show the best we can do in terms of, of the oxygen evolution catalysis, electrocatalysis, then there's only a slight downshift here in, uh, in the oval potential. And that is, I would suggest, is uh, simply due to the fact that uh, all the catalysts that we know how to make are following these, um, this uh, scaling relation here. So we never get close to the optimum. So what's the problem? The problem is that the way we, we make catalysts and think about catalysis at surfaces, all the intermediates and all the transition states, they bind to the same set of atoms in the surface. And that means that when we change the bonding of, of uh, one intermediate, then we also change the bonding of a transition state uh, in pretty much the same way. And that limits our ability to really design a good catalyst. So what we need to do is to find catalysts that have more functionality or, or other dimensions to them. Uh, we, it could be that we uh, need to have a bifunctional catalyst that we should add promoters in, in homogeneous catalysis and in enzyme catalysis, very often transition states are stabilized by hydrogen bonding due to ligands that get close to the transition state. So if we can stabilize the transition state without stabilizing the final state, then uh, we can make a much more efficient catalyst. Confinement effects, what have you. I mean, your imagination really sets the limit here, but we need to think differently about how to, how to make catalysts. Let me just point out that actually, here's a, a great example of, of uh, actually finding such an effect uh, uh, empirically, because if we uh, look again at ammonia synthesis, as I mentioned earlier, uh, for the industrial catalyst, one actually adds potassium as a promoter. Now, why do you do that? Well, we can understand that very easily. What I'm showing down here is the scaling relation between the transition state of nitrogen dissociation as a function of the nitrogen bond energy. I've shown many of these now. The red dots are for metal steps. And the blue 
are what what you get if you get have potassium sitting there also helping the process. What is happening is that we are stabilizing the transition state without stabilizing the the nitrogen bond energy in the same way. Now, why are we doing that? It's very, very simple electrostatics. When you put potassium on a surface, then it is so electropositive that it gives up its electron to the surface. So we have a positively charged potassium and a negative charge here. In the transition state for nitrogen dissociation, you're actually pulling electrons out into the antibonding states of the molecule. And that means we have a dipole with electrons flowing out and that interacts attractively with the dipole with the, where the um, uh, electrons are pushed in like the, the promoter here. And that's the effect, simple electrostatics, but very, very efficient. Now, there may be other ways of, uh, of uh, doing this. At least on, on the computer, we can, we can make uh, any kind of active site we want. And here's, a, here's an example of, of some active sites that uh, Ayu Singh and Joey Montoya and Brian Raw and, and Charlie Tsai uh, made uh, on the computer. You can see that they can easily find materials that are way off the scaling line and into this, this uh, region of optimal catalysis. Typical points here are actually dimers, for instance, of something very reactive sitting in a matrix of something totally unreactive. And the reason it works is, is the following. The transition state energy in this case is not very, very changed, but the bond energy of the nitrogen is changed a lot. So if, for instance, rhenium sits out here or molybdenum sits out here, it binds very strongly. But if you only have two molybdenum atoms, then the nitrogen cannot get a high coordination number of molybdenum as it would like on a, on a clean surface. And therefore, on the dimer, it actually moves in here. So these points in here are actually not, not transition states that are stabilized. It's actually final states that are destabilized. But that works equally well. The problem is, of course, to have a structure like this uh, stable. So. Uh, we're still looking for somebody who can make something stable here and that would be extremely interesting. Let me uh, turn to uh, electrochemical nitrogen reduction. So imagine we had an electrochemical cell like the one I, sh I showed earlier and we could combine it with say a solar cell in the, even in, in the field. We could we could simply, when the sun is shining, then it could run. It would need water, so it would only be when water is present. And then you would produce a little bit of ammonia all the time. That's actually how nature does it. The enzyme nitrogenase does exactly the same. It produces just a little bit of fertilizer all the time. So all the problems we have when we usually use fertilizer, namely that we apply too much and it runs off and uh, does all kind of damage to the waterways and, and oceans, that could be avoided if we could do this. And really, we wouldn't need very much. I mean, it turns out if we uh, had, a, had a catalyst, even if it had a one volt over potential, if it had a 100% Faraday efficiency, all we would need would be one, five square meters of off the shelf uh, solar panels per hectare of field in order to provide all the fertilizer that uh, we needed. The problem is we do not have a catalyst that can run at one volt over potential and 100% Faraday efficiency. And of those two, the biggest problem is actually the, the fact that, that the selectivity or Faraday efficiency is uh, of what we know is very poor. Even if we doubled the old potential, it would just be 10 square meters, right? It, it, it wouldn't be too bad. But uh, today we're looking more, at least until recently, at less than 1% of uh, selectivity rather than 100%. And uh, of course, if it's only 1%, then we would need 500 square meters of, uh, of solar cells. And that would be totally out of the question. So this is very, very important. Now, 
why is it that it doesn't work so well? Well, you probably guessed it already. We have a scaling relation that prevents it from getting into the most interesting region. You can see it here. These are, this is some measure of, of, of electrocatalytic activity plotted as a function of two descriptors. One is related to the activation of the N2 molecule, and the other is related to the bonding of NH or NH2 to the surface. You see the optimum is here. All the known materials that have been tested, they're way off the optimum. That's one problem. The other problem is that uh, all of these materials are much better at, at reducing protons than at reducing nitrogen. So what, I, what I'm showing over here is some measure of the catalytic activity. Actually, it's a, it's a logarithmic uh, measure. It's basically running things along this line here. You see rhenium binds to weakly, uh, too strongly, sorry, and then everything over here to weakly, and that's what you what is shown here. These are is a measure of the rate of ammonia synthesis in black, and in blue you have the rate of hydrogen evolution, and uh, it is much faster for all of these for making hydrogen and for making ammonia, and that's what gives you this very poor Faraday efficiency. So we have an activity challenge and a selectivity challenge, um, both. So let me focus on the selectivity challenge here, simply for the reason that I just mentioned that this is by far the worst problem. And you can, you can imagine uh, what the problem is. The problem is the following. You, you run this reaction at negative potentials. That's a potential where you attract protons to the surface. And therefore, at these potentials, you're going to fill the whole surface up with hydrogen. And when the second proton comes in, it picks up the, hydro the hydrogen already there and form H2. And therefore, all you do all the time is that you run the hydrogen evolution process here. Now, if you could only make sure that the nitrogen that you lead in has access to the surface without the surface being totally covered by, by, by hydrogen, then uh, you would stand a chance of making more ammonia than hydrogen. How would you do that? Well, you can imagine various scenarios uh, as uh, illustrated by these panels here. Just take a look at this uh, upper left panel here. What if instead of having an aqueous sol uh, sol uh, solution, then we have only, we have an a product solvent and then just a little bit of water or a little bit of proton carrier. Then we starve the surface of access to protons and therefore the nitrogen can get to the surface before the protons get there. And when the protons arrive, then you make ammonia rather than hydrogen. That would be one way of doing this. There are other ways you can uh, try to protect your surface as illustrated here by something uh, that is uh, uh, that that does not interact attractively with, with water or you can actually starve it in electrons instead of starving it in in uh, protons both are, are are possible strategies and let me try and show you a collection of experimental data here that illustrate this principle very well. So here are lots of experimental data from different groups. Uh, it is uh, the Faraday efficiency in, in percent. So we want to be here at 100% efficiency. And uh, here you have the partial current density. That means the rate. And uh, there are various catalysts here. And uh, there are also different symbols here, and that depends on each, each symbol uh, shows, uh, shall we say, more and more reliable experiments. In fact, some of these uh, don't even try to run it without nitrogen to, sh to show that the ammonia you make comes actually from nitrogen reduction. They are the gray points. Uh, the blue is with blank tests but no isotope labeling to make sure that the nitrogen actually comes from the N2. And only the red points are actually with, with the isotope labeling 
and blank, and blank tests. And then there's one more uh, type of, uh, of uh, points here, and they are the filled symbols. They are when you are in a non-aqueous solution. And as I argued before, that should give a much higher uh, Faraday efficiency. And you see, sure enough, all of those up here, this here is, is a non-reliable non, uh, uh, experiment. All of those up here are actually with filled symbols. So that's exactly illustrating what I, uh, what I, what I showed you. There's only one experimental data point here, or two actually, but they're, they're only those here where uh, the experiment is done with a quantitative isotope test. And these are, these are experiments that I'll, I'll talk about uh, now. Uh, it's the so-called lithium mediated reduction. So let me show you the principle down here. What you do is you run your reduction process at such negative potentials that you have lithium in solution and you plate the lithium. And then the lithium acts as the catalyst for N2 uh, dissociation and you transfer protons in this case from ethanol uh, and you make ammonia. So the plating of the lithium, that's exactly what happens when you, when you, uh, when you charge your lithium ion battery you run at a negative enough potential that the lithium gets on the surface. It's always pristine, clean, and therefore the nitrogen can get down and dissociate. And, and uh, here are experimental data showing, uh, for instance, ammonia production versus hydrogen production as a function of the pressure of nitrogen. You can see you can get fairly high, high uh, uh, efficiencies here. And over here, I'm illustrating the, the uh, the uh, very, very precise test that is, is needed in order to make sure that the ammonia you make actually comes from the nitrogen. This was first actually uh, uh, discovered in the 30s. And then it was rediscovered or, or studied more, I should say, by Suneto and, and, uh, and uh, co-workers in the 90s. And then only recently, a number of groups um, at DTU here, at, at Stanford and at MIT has taken this up and now it's uh, confirmed um, uh, what is going on. Now, so this here is, is here we say the first really reliable experimental illustration of electrochemical nitrogen reduction. And the problem, it, it has several problems. Well, there, there's some good things about it. You can get 20% Faraday efficiency, for instance, but it's really an unstable system and it's illustrated here. What is shown here, follow in blue here, the working electrode potential as a function of time. So it runs sort of fairly, fairly well. It, this runs at a current, uh, constant current density, but then you see after an hour, a little less than an hour, there are three different experiments here a little uh, around an hour into the experiment, the, the potential starts diverging and the whole system becomes unstable. Uh, and obviously there's something wrong when, when you run a process where all, of, all the time you're depositing lithium. I mean, eventually you're gonna run out of lithium. So it's not really a scalable process. So what we, uh, we uh, suggested was that uh, perhaps instead of just running it at a constant negative potential, we actually uh, uh, cycle the potential up and down. So we deposit, then we, we uh, release, then we deposit, then we release. And these are actually, this is a long-term experiment now where you run up and down in both current density and potential. And you can see that now you can keep it stable for hours and hours, we run 120 hours, no problem, just days on and on. And we can get uh, very high Faraday efficiencies, close to 40% now uh, with this process. And this is something that we can understand. We have a, 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 a very, uh, very good model uh, to, uh, to describe this. So this is at least a, a starting point for developing uh, such uh, technology. Now, 
let me try and summarize what, what I've been uh, describing here. Um, the, I've tried to first introduce some concepts that, that uh, I think are useful if one wants to understand trends in catalysis. And uh, the key are these scaling relations. It's the scaling relations that allow us to take these very multi-dimensional problems and project them onto a few descriptors that we can begin to understand what goes on. That is what gives us volcano relationships quantitatively now, because we know where the optimum is, and therefore we can use that as a design criterion, as I illustrated, for instance, here with the cobalt molybdenum catalyst for ammonia synthesis. Now, the, what I illustrated in, in, in the second half is that this is all well and good. This simplifies things enormously, but it really also shows what are the, the limiting factors in finding completely new systems, completely new catalysts. We need a new paradigm where we get more functionality in, in the active site. And I, I try to illustrate that. And, and uh, uh, this goes also for uh, the question of, of, of selectivity. We actually also perhaps need a paradigm shift in the way we uh, design chemical plants. So today you make ammonia in enormous plants, but you could also make ammonia for fertilizer just in, in, a, in a small little electrochemical plant that would be in the field basically where, where you run it. Why not? If the energy source is the sun, then you might as well. When we uh, look forward to um, what, what we need to do, we really need to start looking for non-traditional solutions, not just in, in, uh, in, in how we make catalysts, breaking these scaling relations, but also in terms of, of reaction conditions. I illustrated it with the, with the uh, non-product solvent here. And also when we uh, talk about um, uh, uh, shall we say, um, process design, let me put it that way. I think a lot of what we uh, can learn, we can learn also from homogeneous catalysis and not least from enzyme catalysis. Uh, but still we have enormous challenges ahead. And I think probably the most central in all of this is that we, any, any production of of sustainable production of uh, fuels and chemicals start with water splitting. And uh, if we, we, we really need to find better catalysts for the water splitting, and there we are up against one of these scaling relations that keep us away from the optimum. And, uh, and we need to find ways of, uh, of fixing that. Now, a large number of, of uh, students, postdocs and uh, and collaborators have contributed to what I've been talking about. I've shown their names along the way, but let me make sure that I, I point uh, to Ayu Singh, Brian Wall, Mike Stat here, uh, my, uh, some of my Stanford students, and Vanessa Bukas, uh, Ankit Jain, and uh, Mega Anand uh, that are postdocs here at DTU, but also a number of, of former students and postdocs that are now um, uh, pursuing independent careers uh, at, the, at the universities, Frank, Frank Abel Peterson, AJ Medford, Alexander Bojvodic, Sackle Ulysses, Felix Stutt, Joey Montoya, and uh, Thomas Pligard. And uh, not least, a number of experimental collaborators that have been brave enough to do experiments here, Ip Korkendorf, Jakob Kipsgaard, Tom Harmio, Anna Stilson, Matteo Cagnello, and a number of people at, at Helder Topsu that have been uh, doing this and uh, funding here. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor, for your enlightening lecture over here. And uh, now we will leave the floor open for the questions. You may raise your hand or you can send the questions to me directly and then I can ask. So does anyone have any questions?
We can ask one, uh, Mortaza. Please, Professor, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, really amazing uh, presentation. Uh, it was really enjoyable to watch it. I have two questions. One is on the this uh, in which you use the volcano plot, and then you mentioned the molybdenum and cobalt can be combined to make an optimal solution. Is this a strategy always a work? Can we use it in other concept in which we combine two different metals from the volcano block to go to the optimum? That is one question. And the second one is a bit more related to Qatar. So Qatar is full with um, natural gas and methane. So mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit more, for example, how this kind of work can help us to make catalysis related to the methane chemistry? <laughs> I know it's a little bit general question, but it would be really just interesting to see your ideas related to this. Uh, uh, in, so the first in, question. Overlook. Thank you very much. Yeah. Your, your first question, whether you can always take um, uh, catalyst to the right and the left of, of the volcano and get into the optimum. The answer is in principle, yes. In practice, not always, because what, what, what you need is a system where the two atoms are kind enough to stay at the surface under reaction conditions. And very often what happens is that um, uh, one of the elements uh, segregate to the surface and uh, dominate everything. So you need a very strong ordering energy to, to make this possible. In fact, I think for the cobalt molybdenum system, it's actually related to the fact that there's a little bit of nitrogen in there. It's a subnitrite, and that keeps a structure in place. That's uh, how, how I think about it. We have other examples where, where it has succeeded, uh, but, but, uh, uh, but, but you also run into other, other issues. One example where it succeeded, uh, and, and, and uh, that uh, relates to your to your, uh, your uh, well, it, this for, for making methane, you, you can do this. Uh, for, for natural gas um, uh, processing, I mean, we have been applying these both to understand steam reforming in, in great detail, um, explaining why nickel is, is the best catalyst and, and what, what you can do to promote it. Uh, what we've also spent, been spending a lot of effort on is uh, trying mm -hmm. to understand why it is so difficult to take methane and react it with oxygen and form methanol. As I'm sure you uh, would agree, if we had such a process, we would, uh, we would be in a great situation. Certainly, uh, for instance, in, in the Middle East, uh, a lot of, of gas is flared simply because it cannot be used and transported away. So, this is obviously very important for, for the local economy, but also uh, for climate. And, uh, and so if we could do that, that would be fantastic. Um, in short, our, our conclusion is um, that one, one, of the, one of the issues is always that you take methane you react it with oxygen. You can actually do that and make methanol. The problem is that methanol is more reactive than methane. And therefore you oxidize it further and you end up with CO2. So the strategies that we've been looking at and, and we're still looking at and have made are mostly related to how can you, how can you uh, get rid of the methanol before it reacts further. One, one possibility that a, a number of groups have looked at is to have basically a cyclic process where you, where you stop after one cycle and then you get rid of the, the uh, methanol, as, as you know. But we've also been looking at finding absorbers that can take the methanol out. So I, I think, again, one, one, one needs to look at, at non-traditional catalysis. But uh, yes, uh, the, the short answer to your second question is, yes, uh, these uh, principles uh, do apply to these processes as, as well. And, and we've certainly obtained some insights. We, we haven't found a good way of making methanol, but uh, I'm sure if we had, then you had heard about it. So, but uh, we, we, it's, it's, a, it's a very intriguing and uh, interesting uh, 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 question. You, you can probably find a, a few papers out there that, uh, that uh, shed some light on on why it's so difficult. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Ahmed Badruldin. Uh, Ahmed, you can unmute and ask uh, your question. Um, yeah. Uh, nice talk. Thank you for that. Um, I have a question regarding the. So you mentioned the activity descriptors and selectivity descriptors, uh, but for catalysis generally, stability is also a very important thing. So um, can DFT or like computational methods generally um, sort of, do they, is there an established uh, stability, like set of stability descriptors for catalysts? Uh, I, I wouldn't say that, that we have selectivity descriptors. It is something we can calculate, but, but of course, uh, and, and it is something that we are constantly um, uh, thinking about and looking at for specific systems. I think the, the big systematic study, uh, including finding good descriptors that, so we don't have to just calculate the stability of each phase we can think of, that uh, is still an open question. But okay, I have another uh, question. Uh, mm -hmm. If I can go that okay, so um, so for the oxygen evolution reaction, uh, lately in the last I think two years uh, or three years, um, the you know the discovery of layer double hydroxides and some oxyhydroxides like nickel iron, uh, yeah. LDH, they broke the scaling relationship and now they're I think at an over potential of you know 170 one, 180 millivolts. So when it comes to like the nitrogen reduction uh, reaction, will it depend uh, on an experimental like a a discovery from an experimental I'm, I, point of view. I'm not totally sure that they have broken the uh, scaling relation there. And and uh, I mean these uh, iron nickel oxyhydroxides they have been known for 50 years. Uh, so I think that there may be uh, better ways of synthesizing with a higher surface area, specific surface area, things like that. But uh, at least to my knowledge, I, I could be wrong here. But uh, to, at least to my knowledge. It's not because each site is more active. Mm -hmm. but, okay. uh, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, professor, we have a question here uh, uh, from the audience. So mm -hmm. what is the determining factor of the deviation from the scaling relationship in some of the electrocatalysts? I mean, if, if, if you're talking about why there are sort of points that are a little off, uh, let's see if I can find one here that they're sort of a little off here. I think most of it is actually uh, computational uncertainty. I believe the scaling lines much more than the individual points, if, if, if that was the question. Okay. Yeah. I hope that answers it. Professor, one more question is that uh, in your papers, um, you have mentioned that DFT should be used as a pre-step to screen catalysts, but what approach would you advise for someone who is not very experienced in DFT and how could they experimentally achieve those and efficiently achieve screening of the different catalysts? Yeah, I think it's often it's not, just, it's not just that you do the calculations, it's actually also the way you think about it, right? And they, so it's more the concepts that, that I try to, to illustrate that, that one should, uh, should think about. So for instance, the fact that cobalt molybdenum should be somewhere between cobalt and molybdenum, that was actually an experimental who, who first said, well, that, that ought to be so, right? And then we did the calculation, but it was based on having the concept first. Then you can actually make lots of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, thinking even without doing a, a, a full calculation. If we go back to this question of, if I uh, can find this here, I mean, if, if you want to think about how you can stabilize a transition state for say uh, the adding of protons and electrons to uh, N2, let's say, then you can certainly think about how you can put ligands on even without doing a, a calculation, right? So a lot of it you can do without access to or, or, or ability to do uh, calculations, but you can actually, once you know what you're looking for, you can, you can use your chemical uh, intuition to uh, begin to uh, uh, propose new catalysts and test them. You need to be able to synthesize them and test them. Yeah. Um, 
We have a question from Professor Ahmed Abdul Wahab. Uh, Professor, you can go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, th thank you, Murtaza. Thank you, Dr. Nosko, for this very actually interesting presentation. Uh, I have a couple of questions. The first one you mentioned, that, like uh, adding something like potassium, which is positively charged, will enhance the activity of uh, nitrogen reduction. Mm -hmm. uh, would it work the same way for oxidation reactions? For example, if you add like a negatively charged kind of uh, uh, ion, like an ions, does it work to enhance, for example, oxygen evolution reactions? Or what do you think? Uh, I I don't know of any such example, but I, I think it's a very good observation. Might might be worth thinking about. Yeah, right. Good. Uh, the other question is: there are some efforts now in uh, using uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, yeah. also for screening catalyst and uh, uh, design. How do you see this going forward? Well, I I I, I have a lot of a lot of faith in uh, in 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 artificial intelligence machine learning in to to sort of enhance the the number of systems we can treat i mean with the calculations we are still very heavy um, and if we can uh, use machine learning to if you like interpolate between the calculations we have in order to get somewhere where new that would be good i also think uh, using the uh, uh, machine learning in in sort of automated um, experimental optimization, I also think is something that looks very promising. I don't think we've seen sort of real examples yet, but I'm, I'm sure it will come. Thank you. Thanks. Um, do we have any other questions in the audience? Does anyone want to ask anything? I don't think there are any. Um, Professor, so I'll ask one final question and I think we can end the le uh, lecture there. Um, I'm a graduate student and we have a lot of graduate students who are uh, here present with us in this lecture. And some of us want to go ahead in the industry. Some of us want to go ahead in academia. And as we all are trying to figure out our careers, so there's a huge path that goes ahead of us. What is one piece of advice would you like to advise our, the graduate students so that they maintain in their course of life? That, that, that could be a whole new lecture here, but let, let me, let me I, I think one very important thing is go and do something that you, that you think is, that, that, that you have your whole heart in, that, that is important, that, that uh, gives you fulfillment, uh, money is not everything. Having having a having a, a career where you go to work every day and you uh, look forward to it and you're excited about it that's uh, that's uh, probably the richest life you can have. And there are many ways you can do that. I'm not saying this is in industry. You, that could be in industry. That could be in in uh, in academia. It could be teaching. You know, there are many many ways of, of ha having a rich life, but I think that's that's the key. That's okay. Um, does anyone, last call, but like, is there anyone else who wants to ask any question? Um, if uh, not, in that case, uh, I guess that will be the conclusion of this lecture. Uh, thank you everyone for joining and thank you Professor Norsko for uh, giving us your valuable time in order to deliver an insightful piece in catalysis that we got to learn today. And uh, we, as GSA, we look forward to serving you with more events. So thank you once again. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you every, everybody for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.